And thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for for the invitation, everyone. Um, uh, it's uh, it, it's I've heard so many good things from from people who are really enthusiastic about the workshop and everything that we've been hearing about. Um, so I'm actually not going to speak very much about subcortex. I'm going to be mostly talking about methods that we've been developing, um, which we've been applying in a in a in a range of of different applications. Um, but where the, the the overarching theme is uh, related to much of what we've heard um, uh, in linking MRI with microscopy um, for multi scale neuroscience. Um, and so I, I, I don't really need to show this slide. Everybody shows this kind of slide. The reason why I, I do like to show it though, and this, this concept of, of there being um, relationships between structure and function over, I mean, something like probably nine orders of magnitude in the brain. Um, here I'm showing about six. The reason why I like to show this is because I think this, this view of things, although it's, it's useful, it, it kind of actually poses a particular mindset when it comes to imaging tools that we have. Which is that you see that this this way of looking at things kind of places MRI at an end, and I think um, that view, although in some senses accurate, it actually gives you a particular impression of of imaging methods, particularly MRI, um, being um, uh, sort of at, you know at the end of a process or at one extreme of of what we can do in neuroscience, uh, and I actually kind of take issue with that. Um, the sort of uh, a view of challenges of scale. I actually kind of prefer a, a, a different way of looking at it, which is more like this. Um, so one of the things that I think is really powerful about MRI uh, and neuroimaging more, more generally is uh, that it allows us to integrate across levels of investigation. So we can take basically exactly the same tool. Um, we can, we can small, uh, scan small uh, segments of tissue. We've heard a lot about that. Uh, we can use it in rodents, potentially uh, it, uh, along with causal um, experimental manipulations. We can do it in patients. And with my other hat on, we can do it at the level of, of populations. And I think it's really hard to find another tool that it actually enables you, the same tool to be used in all of these different ways. And I think that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. And that is something that my group has been uh, sort of taking on as a, as, a, as a key challenge. What do you need to do to actually really take advantage of this flexibility that imaging offers? <clears throat> and this is very similar to um, a slide that we've seen in, in different forms um, several times today already, um, which is making the point about um, postmortem MRI. Uh, as a bridge between very different levels of investigation. So on the one hand, we have in vivo MRI, uh, where we have sort of poor resolution and, and, and um, poor specificity of signals. Uh, and at the other end, we have things like optical imaging microscopy, um, which confers specificity by virtue of resolution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have kind of opposite characteristics in terms of the number of brains that we can we can study with these with these methods. And so if we're going to relate these things to each other and 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 leverage their their complementary strengths, what we need is a bridge. And and what I'm going to tell you about is the, are, are some of the ways that my group is exploring postmortem MRI as um, one version of this bridge, where you have the same uh, tissue and tissue state as you have in microscopy, but then you have the same signals as you have in in vivo MRI. So I'm gonna start with some of the technical challenges and then I'll go into a few of the different ways that we've been exploring what you can do um, when you have this kind of data, um, in particular where you have uh, microscopy and postmortem MRI in the same brains. So um, when we got into this uh, in the first instance, um, uh, we were sort of given a brain by a, um, uh, a um, a neurosurgery colleague who is interested in looking into deep brain stimulation. Um, and so one of the first things we did was to try to get some good structural scans. Uh, this is an example of a structural scan we got back in about 2007 or eight um, at 3T without very much um, optimization at all. It was absolutely gorgeous. And so we thought this is gonna be really powerful and amazing. Um, but what we really wanted to do is to explore diffusion. Uh, and we'd seen some of these data from people like uh, Tim Derby, who is doing absolutely gorgeous imaging um, uh, in, in monkey brains that fit into rodent scanners. Uh, and so he can take a whole monkey brain and, and, and scan it um, using the kind of hardware that we have for small animals. Uh, and so if you take this and you try to do that kind of imaging on a whole human brain, which was what we were aiming for, uh, you get images that look kind of like this. So. 
This is a diffusion weighted spin echo scan. It's the same sequence that you use in vivo. I can see Annika laughing at how horrible it looks. Um, it's really dreadful. Uh, and that's the, the, the key difference here. It's not that the tissue is in a different state really. It's that we have to use a human scanner once a brain gets above some size. And so that is one of the key challenges that my group has been aiming to address is can we actually get something like what we have on the left uh, using in a human brain, um, using a human scanner. And so that was our first challenge. One of the first things you have to do is you have to actually one of the most critical things you have to do is, um, is, is start to get a really good setup. So this is something where uh, I should say in the, in, the, in the middle here, this is a, a, um, a holder that Allard Robrick um, designed and was kind enough to share with us. Um, we developed you know, some really um, basic but you know, really key um, uh, ways of, of packing samples in such that you can get decent um, data quality. And most of all, it comes down to things like imaging bubbles, shim quality. Um, it's, it's, it's not, to me, it wasn't the most exciting thing in the world, but it, it turns out to be really important. So that's one of the first technical challenges. A second technical challenge you have to address uh, relates to tissue properties. Um, so as has been discussed already, when you, um, uh, when you fix tissue and, and when we're dealing with human brains, unless we're going to wade into fresh tissue, which we can talk about um, uh, uh, following on um, from Evgenia's uh, thoughts, um, but in general, we're going to be dealing with fixed tissue. Um, and it just, changes the properties of uh, the brain. And in particular, the single biggest problem is, is, is this point on the left here, which is that if you have fixed tissue and you can't sort of wash out the fixative, you have this massive reduction in T2. And that's the biggest challenge, but actually T1s and ADCs also alter in really challenging ways. So if you want to do diffusion imaging, uh, you have to find a way of dealing with this. Um, and the, the, the really difficult thing um, is that uh, diffusion weighted um, spin echoes, like shown here, um, have fundamentally a, a relationship between the, the B value that you can achieve in your diffusion imaging, so the, the contrast that you have, uh, and how long it takes to, um, to, to create that, that contrast. And what it does is it stretches out the time until you get to measure the signal, until you form your image. And so that's that's a big challenge. Um, it's a, basically a coupling that is really problematic in spin echo. So one of the very first contributions that we made in the space was um, to actually propose moving away from the classic diffusion weighted spin echo. And in fact, we adopt a sequence known as SSFP. It's a sequence that I, I worked with a lot um, during my PhD, trying desperately to make this work in vivo, but it's horribly motion sensitive. Fortunately, as soon as I got into postmortem imaging, motion was no longer a problem. <clears throat> and it turns out that this is a, a great sequence to work with <clears throat> because of the fact that it decouples the B value from the, the echo time. <clears throat> okay. And so after quite a few years of development, we were able to move from spin echo uh, sequences at 3T <coughs> to improvements um, using SSFP and finally up to 7T. And we, we can get beautiful images like I'm showing here at 0.5 millimeter resolution. This is a data set that was acquired by Sean Foxley. I'll, I'll return to it later because it's a really beautiful data set. But there was quite a lot of development that it took to get to the point where we could really reliably get good data quality using these sequences. <clears throat> so that's the, um, those are the sort of technical challenges that we've been addressing on the MRI side for diffusion imaging. So we then wanna compare that to microscopy. Uh, and there are a number of challenges that, that also brings in itself <clears throat> to properly measure microstructure. So uh, one of the studies that we've been undertaking is looking at ALS. Uh, and this is where um, Manuka Palabaj, Gamaralaj in our group has um, a huge experience in histopathology. And so she has designed a very ambitious <coughs> whole brain sampling scheme shown here that aims to look at a broad uh, range of regions that are known to be involved in ALS, as well as associated pathologies. And again, I'll return to this study in a moment. It's, it's something that's, that's ongoing. But one of the things that you'll notice here uh, are that the, the data that we have are accompanied by these photographs. 
So these are photographs here <coughs> taken before um, as well as after the sampling of, of um, histology. Uh, and that's something that we use to guide <coughs> our image registration. Um, and that image registration problem that we have, I'll come back to in a moment. Um, actually, I'll come, to, I'll come to it now and return to that slide. So the reason why we, we have photographs is that the problem that we have is a bit different from the one uh, that Annika was describing, where you have large um, sections that, to, that you're trying to do a 2D to 2D alignment to. The problem that we face, because we're not actually um, sectioning the whole brain, we're trying to section a large number of brains with a decent number of regions, is that we have these small histology slides that we then need to, <clears throat> that are 2D and like a single section from a given brain region, which we then need to somehow co-register into a large 3D MRI volume. And that's, you know, it is a different challenge. And it's, a, again, a challenge that has, um, uh, has to deal with all of these issues around, you know, tissue tears and deformations and, and things like that. And that's a problem that um, Istvan Hussar, who's recently finished his PhD with Mark Jenkinson um, in Oxford, um, has really taken on with gusto. Uh, and he's developed a new tool uh, that's able to use those intermediary photographs <clears throat> in order to, in, a, in an uh, automated way, to take these 2D um, histology thin slides from a, a, re a relatively small region <clears throat> and through a series of staged registrations, get them all the way into aligned to that 3D MRI volume. Um, and it's, it's hugely encouraging because if you're going to do this kind of study where you're aiming to look at many different brain regions, um, it's just not feasible to have um, much manual intervention um, in that stage. So <clears throat> um, in addition, uh, we want to um, move away from the more manual um, analyses of the microscopy data itself. And so uh, uh, Daniel Kaur um, here, oops, Ah, Daniel Kaur, um, who is uh, um, in his second year of his PhD, is starting to develop um, automated pipelines for extracting uh, semi-quantitative measures from uh, immunohistochemistry. Um, so in, here, for example, we have a stained area fraction map. So this is just the fraction of a given <clears throat> reconstructed superpixel that is taken up with the, um, the targeted uh, protein stain, so um, uh, a, a, a chromogen called DAB is used to impart this brown stain to the, um, the protein that is of, of interest. And what Daniel has done is to come up with a, a pipeline that does automated um, processing, including um, automated color deconvolution, uh, local thresholding for determining these stained area fractions. And that then is fed um, into <coughs> into this, um, this co-registration pipeline that Istvan has developed so that we can do pixel-wise correlations. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, we don't, we're not yet far enough along to show you the results of, of those associations, <coughs> but that is something that we're actively working on. Another microscopy technique that we've picked up and started to work with, which we've already heard about today, is polarized light imaging. Um, so we don't have a particularly sophisticated setup for this, but what we have been able to do, which um, is actually um, an entirely um, uh, uh, feasible project with a standard light mi microscope, um, is to fit a standard light microscope with a series of, of polarizers, um, including this rotating polarizer um, that you use <clears throat> then to estimate the, um, how the birefringence of um, the myelinated fibers uh, changes the polarization of light, and so you get these um, this this um, pattern of transmitted light that um, depends on the orientation of the fibers. Um, so this is in this case a purely two D technique, um, but we've been able to use that to to um, in a relatively basic setup um, created by Yiren Molink shown here, <clears throat> in order to ask some um, you know still some quite interesting questions um, where we acquire polarized light imaging in the same tissue uh, samples that we've subjected to MRI. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of eye candy, because everybody loves to look at polarized light imaging, this is a beautiful image of the cerebellum um, that Yiren acquired as one of his um, first samples. Looking at these, these images, you can really get um, a feel for the exquisite detail uh, that this technique can give. Um, but Yiren um, very quickly took on <clears throat> the, uh, the task of really using this 
in a much more quantitative way. And I'll, I'll show some results from that in a moment. Um, here's a, <clears throat> a non-quantitative example um, of polarized light imaging acquired in the same um, brain where we acquired that. This is that same 0.5 millimeter diffusion data set. Um, we're on the right, <clears throat> I'm showing some deterministic tractography. So this is in the ponds. And you can really start to get a feel both for um, what the polarized light imaging is able to show in, in terms of the, the sort of exquisitely complicated fiber structure, but also that at this kind of resolution, you really do start to see things, um, properties like <clears throat> interdigitation of pathways. In this case, um, uh, the um, crossing pontine fibers where the um, cortical spinal tract is, is um, running uh, superior inferior, and then that's interdigitated um, with these um, crossing pontine fibers that are moving between the two hemispheres of the ponds. <clears throat> so what can we do with these kinds of techniques? So that's the basic technical, um, well, it, 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 some examples of the technical development that we've been doing. Um, and now I just want to give just a, a few of the different ways that you can use this kind of data, because I think oftentimes, um, you know, we the, the, the first thing that we go to is not necessarily the most exciting um, kinds of approaches that we can that we can use when we have data like this is very unusual. So I'll start with um, what I call classic MRI histo. So <clears throat> mapping out relationships and thinking about you know relations to gold standards. And so in in this kind of a of a study, um, we could we could maybe view um, the way that we have have these um, two data sets interact like this. So we have some kind of uh, gold standard with quotes around it because we all know that every gold standard has its own caveats. Um, so some kind of microscopy data. <clears throat> and then we have our non-specific MRI signal. Um, and what we're aiming to do is to basically try to use that gold standard to, to in some sense, validate the non-specific MRI. And we're going to do that in the form of a correlation. So this is kind of the most basic thing that we can try to do. So one example of, of that from our group, um, this is work again by Jürgen Mullink. Um, in this case, he's not doing whole brain imaging, <clears throat> but he had um, uh, some hippocampal tissue samples and he wanted to explore the perforant path. So uh, perforant path um, is a pathway within the hippocampal form formation. It's, it's part of the um, circuit of Papez. Uh, and what he wanted to do is ask a question specifically in ALS as to <clears throat> whether it seems to be that there's an involvement of the perforant path in ALS, because there are, are reasons to expect that there might be. And so, uh, well, so what Yudin did is he acquired some polarized light imaging data alongside other histopathology data um, and acquired diffusion data in the, in the, same, uh, the same samples. <clears throat> and the first thing that he was able to show, which was kind of a nice demonstration of the ability to use polarized light imaging, um, not just to depict neuroanatomy, but to actually to, to, to ask a question in a clinical context um, or a pathological context, at least. Uh, was to, he, he was able to demonstrate that not only do you find um, uh, differences between um, controls and ALS patients um, in the, this, this perforant pathway um, with respect to myelin and neurofilament uh, markers using immunohistochemistry, but actually you can also find significant um, uh, difference with, differences with respect to the retardants um, uh, parameter calculated from polarized light imaging. And so it was a nice demonstration of a way that you can use polarized light Im imaging um, beyond its sort of um, uh, the, the context that it's usually presented in. And so here he was able to show that um, this, this limbic pathway, um, the perforant pathway, uh, seems to have some involvement in ALS, which in and of itself is interesting. But then in addition, he was able to show um, that he was, he was able to pull out some uh, correlations between the, the different um, retardance measures in, in um, polarized light imaging against some of the diffu uh, diffusion-based parameters uh, uh, estimated from uh, the, the MR data. I mean, they're not the most beautiful correlations in the world, but they, they, are, um, they, they certainly seem to be showing a consistent pattern. And they're consistent with um, what we see uh, when we look at um, the immunohistochemistry stains for myelin that we might more um, uh, commonly consider to be um, uh, you know, the kind of property that you would be looking at to validate against um, uh, MRI against um, uh, microscopy. <clears throat> Uh, in another study, um, we, we, a, a very similar um, question about this, this, you know, um, uh, this sort of um, comorbid pathology in ALS um, 
which is thought to be related to frontotemporal dementia. Um, we also looked at the anterior commissure uh, and again, found um, some correlations uh, in this case um, between a neurofilament marker uh, and um, several uh, MR um, derived diffusivities. And so again, this is a you know, very classic way that we might go to use uh, microscopy data to to aim to validate very much in the lines of um, uh, of, of what Evgenia was presenting and, and nowhere near as detailed. I have to say, I'm I'm I'm, I'm so incredibly impressed with all of the work, um, amazing stuff that, that she and her colleagues have been doing. So that's sort of the the classic um, kinds of, of of ways that we might try to make MRI and and, and microscopy play together. Um, but there are other things we can do um, beyond that, which 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 are um, a bit more difficult to pull off, and a bit more um, they, uh, they 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 rely more strongly on um, uh, on, on uh, having good quality data and very um, well designed models. Um, and so um, some of the, the the work that we've been doing then is is looking at um, where we where where can we um, begin to get a bit more stringent in in terms of what we consider to be a validation. Um, so here, rather than just saying, do two things correlate with each other, um, really what we're doing is, is, is we're trying to build consensus. So we have some MR data. Um, uh, we might pass that through a model to predict microscopy data, or we might do that the other way around. But in, in either case, what we're, what we're doing is a more stringent, um, we're, we're setting a more stringent task for ourselves, which is to say that it's not good enough to, to find that these two types of data correlate with each other. Um, we want them to actually um, one to predict another via some model that, that we can we can rigorously defend. So the first version of that that we did again, um, this is a study led by Yeren Mullink, um, where he took again this 0.5 millimeter um, uh, high resolution data set um, uh, that we acquired in whole brain, uh, and he took a large um, uh, region around um, a section of the col callosum. Uh, in this plane uh, and acquired both polarized light um, imaging and some immunohistochemistry uh, in three samples um, from the callosum. Now, initially we were just looking at this as, this is basically our first test bed. That was one of the first images that we got because we thought, well, you know, the callosum fibers are very collinear. Um, they're very, um, you know, well, um, uh, they're very strongly coherent. Uh, and so this is a, a good test bed for getting polarized light data. But actually, as soon as he got the polarized light imaging data, what we saw was, was this kind of a pattern. It was very consistent across the different samples that we had, which is that on the sort of lateral aspects of the callosum, the fibers seem to be extremely coherent. But right in the middle, um, we had this sort of chaotic pattern uh, where that, that, that sort of strong coherence of fibers uh, didn't seem to occur. And so we started looking into this because we thought maybe um, actually we were having cutting issues. We thought we thought that maybe we were causing this as we went to cut the tissue. And that actually the point at which we, we started to believe that maybe it was actually a real effect um, uh, was when we saw it emerge from uh, the from tractography in the same diffusion data um, that we are in the, in the same samples. <clears throat> and so we thought, well, this is a good first um, uh, example project of, of trying to, to relate diffusion MRI um, to microscopy data. Uh, and it was also a nice opportunity to validate a recently proposed model for estimating fiber dispersion um, that Stam Sotheropoulos uh, at our center had, had recently published this model for a way to estimate dispersion. So just how fanned out do the fibers appear to be um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, in terms of the the, the um, diffusion MR signal, so we have a model for dispersion derived from diffusion MRI, and can we use microscopy uh, PLI specifically um, alongside immunohistochemistry uh, to try to validate it? And so what Yuren did, <clears throat> he took our microscopy data, um, for example, the PLI. Um, in every voxel um, in the PLI data, you have an estimate of the fiber orientation, and so you can then pull that over an MRI sized voxel uh, and come up with an estimate of the, um, uh, the, the dispersion or the distribution of those orientations. Um, so Yuren did this <clears throat> actually not just with uh, that PLI data, but he has a similar um, uh, way of estimating um, these properties from um, myelin immunohistochemistry 
3 using structured tensor analysis. Um, and actually, as it turned out, that was the data that we um, that we used primarily um, that we found to be the best predictor of um, <clears throat> uh, or the, had the best agreement with our um, uh, diffusion um, based dispersion estimates. And remarkably, it's not just that, that, that Yiren was able to find a correlation. Looking across three different regions with very different dispersion patterns, including the centrum semi of all, where fibers are very um, chaotically oriented, um, he found that, that not only did he get a good correlation, um, but he actually got good quantitative agreement of um, the, the angle of dispersion between these two modalities. <clears throat> um, Another uh, way that, that we've been um, thinking of using uh, this, this kind of data, um, not, not for validation, but for model development uh, is for example, to, um, to consider how we can use these kinds of data to, um, to inform models as we build them. So for example, um, we've been interested in looking at um, a, a known limitation of tractography, which is um, uh, known as the gyral bias. So if we look at true connections um, in, in a, a gyrus, um, oftentimes what we expect is to see a pattern like this, whereas fibers enter a gyrus, um, many go straight through to the crown of the gyrus, but in order to connect on the banks, uh, they have to turn to enter. And so this is what we expect the, the sort of true connection pattern to be. Um, uh, <clears throat> but if we look at um, diffusion data that has limited resolution, the profiles that we would measure would look something like this. <clears throat> and so when you perform diffusion tractography under these conditions, where you underestimate um, the angle as fibers have to turn due to partial volume effects, then what you end up with is this kind of a bias um, where you, you overestimate how, um, uh, how strongly fibers connect to uh, the, the crowns and you underestimate the connectivity to the banks. Um, so this is something, again, that this kind of data can be really um, powerful for. So this is an example where Sean Foxley um, uh, Yuren, um, acquired some polarized light imaging data, um, and Sean Foxley compared this to his 0.5 millimeter diffusion data. Um, and one thing that this data starts to enable you to do is to ask the question of what kind of spatial resolution would we need in order to be able to actually um, capture this structure using uninformed tractography. Um, so using just very standard um, vanilla deterministic methods, um, uh, you can see that at, at one millimeter resolution, you start to see some of this, um, uh, this, this expected pattern of connectivity, um, but really it's not until you get down to something like 0.5 millimeter that, you, that a, a, a generic tractography algorithm will really start to reflect this structure. And this is something that um, relates nicely then to work that Saj Babdi and Mikhail Katar have been um, undertaking in, in, um, <clears throat> in our lab, trying to build models uh, that are then informed by this. So not uninformed tractography, but methods where you, you, you um, uh, perform tractography in, a, in a, um, a, a mode that aims to identify this kind of um, structure and, and aim to be consistent with it. Um, so the last um, uh, quick topic that I want to cover uh, is, is something a bit different, which is instead of thinking about um, uh, these as, as data sets where one validates another or you predict one using another, um, instead to look at um, uh, uh, these data as um, having some overlap as well as um, areas of, of non-overlap, um, and then asking the question, is there a way um, to, to build that into some kind of a joint model? Um, and this is work that Amy Howard has undertaken at our center. It's going to be using this, um, uh, essentially the same um, kind of uh, uh, property that Yuren was looking at um, in his colossal samples of um, uh, looking at fiber dispersion. But in this case, what Amy was interested to do is to ask if you can use um, uh, microscopy to help to break a, um, a degeneracy of the, 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 the model that we're using in diffusion MRI. And so the idea is that um, if you have, uh, for example, radial diffusion, so the diffusion perpendicular to a fiber, um, as well as dispersion within a voxel, um, diffusion MRI cannot distinguish between those two things. But if alongside that diffusion MRI data, um, you have microscopy, you can, it, it, it can maybe be informative about one of these properties. In this case, it can be informative about dispersion. And so it enables you to break that degeneracy. And so what Amy and has done- wrapping it up? I can, thank you for the reminder. Um, so what Amy has done is to build this kind of a model um, where she 
um, is able to feed in these two types of data um, and co-model them, so model them at the same time in a way that enables her then to break this degeneracy. Um, so this is showing um, uh, on the left that what you would estimate um, if you didn't include um, that joint modeling, which is the degeneracy that I was showing a moment ago. Um, and when you have both types of data, um, uh, you're able to then remove that degeneracy. And the kinds of things that that will enable you to do, for example, are to take, um, if you only had MRI data, you would be estimating um, these orientation distribution functions on the left. Um, but th with the use of a joint model, you're actually able to start seeing the presence of a second fiber population that we know is there. Okay, so I am gonna wrap up, but I'm gonna tell you very quickly about two things that we're quite excited about. Um, one is a, a, um, a resource that we're about to put out there um, that makes many of these data sets available um, to anyone who wants to use them. Uh, we call it the Digital Brain Bank, um, and it includes a range of, of data sets um, from uh, very high resolution human data to a broad range of, of species that Rahir Mars has been um, uh, acquiring uh, and some data where we have um, uh, in uh, uh, ALS in particular, um, histopathology um, in regions of uh, neurodegeneration alongside whole brain MR data. Um, and just to give you a quick pretty picture, um, here's what <clears throat> that very high resolution um, 0.5 millimeter diffusion scan um, looks like. Um, it wasn't easy to acquire, it was a, a five day scan. I think we'd be able to get that time down quite a bit now, but it really is a beautiful data set. Um, and this will be the first time it's been published or released um, as part of the digital brain bank. The other um, <clears throat> quick resource that I, I wanted to plug that will be coming along before too long um, is a data set that Amy Howard has been acquiring that we call Big Mac. So this is a, um, a single macaque brain that was scanned um, in life with both uh, resting fMRI and diffusion data. But then um, Amy um, acquired the brain afterwards <clears throat> and acquired some really quite special diffusion data um, with three shells and a thousand directions in the two outer shells. So this is a very, very long scan time. And she's now acquiring and curating um, whole brain um, PLI <clears throat> and histology. And again, we hope to be making that data available uh, quite soon. So um, that is a few examples of how we think we might be able to achieve this kind of vision. Um, uh, I'd be very happy to talk about ways that we might also um, think about how we, I talked a bit about patients, um, but I think there's a lot that we could do to relate it also to things like the UK Biobank um, in terms of getting to population scales <clears throat> and really leveraging the, the power of this single tool um, that can allow us to do so many different kinds of investigation. So with that, I'll thank you for your patience. I ran over by a couple minutes. Um, and I'd like to thank all of these people. Um, in particular, I'd like to highlight um, Saj Babdi, who I barely mentioned, but has been um, one of the, the key people um, in making all of this happen. So thank you very much. Thank you indeed. And I, I think that last 